this is an artist that I wasn't familiar with and I wasn't sure how all this was going to go until I started to dig into his work. Very interesting fellow, really um, uh, substantial and um, not someone whose work I really ever knew anything about. So um, it was it was a um, a really interesting story to learn about him, and I think his work is really extraordinary. So um, we'll dig in. Um, Frederick Brown was born in Georgia in 1945 and raised in uh, Chicago's South Side. Um, so he was exposed to a lot of blues and and jazz in in that in that situation, and that has remained a, a central theme throughout his career. Um, well, he died in um, in uh, 2012. Um, so let's see. He graduated from. Um, uh, Southern Illinois University in 1968 with a with an art degree, and moved to New York City in 1970, and just landed right in the middle of everything. He he got a 5,000 square foot loft in Soho at uh, kind of Worcester Street, just right in the middle of everything, um, and at that time it was. A rough industrial area. Um, the spaces were raw and cheap, um, and not legal, but available. Uh, <laughs> so he actually set up his studio there, and um, he really got to know the people who were on the cutting edge of the art scene at that point. Um, let's see, uh, yeah, he, the first couple of people that he met, he met, um, um, Anthony Braxton, the jazz musician and, um, Ornette Coleman, um, uh, poets, dancers, painters of various kinds. And it was a very open scene at that point. Um, his loft became kind of a, um, a performance space, a space where people would come and read poetry and do dance performances. And basically he, you know, 5,000 square feet is a pretty big space. So he could find himself a corner to paint in while other people were doing other things in the space. Always had jazz going. You know, there were concerts happening in, in his space and, you know, people were really, it was a really loose scene. Um, you know, 1970 in New York, the 70s were not exactly the, the um, I think you may remember financially, New York was not doing all that great in, in the mid to late 70s. So a lot of this stuff was you know, it was it was cheap real estate, shall we say, which is not any longer. Um, so he came to do a lot of larger scale portraits of jazz musicians, but when he first landed in in the scene, it was really oh, let's see. Okay, here we go. Um, you, you see, this is, this is a shot from, in, um, montage together by a photographer and I can't remember the guy's name at this point, And I should, um, I think it might be, might be Ramos anyway. Um, uh, so you see that it was a real active scene. There was a lot going on there. Um, he married a dancer. And so, you know, there was, there was that, that level of activity inside the space too. Um, and ah, here's, a, here's a giant portrait. This is from 1992. This is not when he first landed, but, 
you know, he got into uh, doing these large scale portraits of jazz musicians, um, started in the late 70s, early 80s, where he started to really get into doing these portraits. Um, when he landed there, it was in the middle of, let's see, minimalism was really popular. And, you know, that was really the kind of cutting edge stuff. There was also the, the business of um, color field painting. So we'll, let's see. Yeah, um, there, there were a group of people like Chuck Close and Alex Katz who were doing these large scale portraits. And so, you know, this is a big portrait of Louis. We're talking, you know, uh, 84 by 72 inches. Um, very expressive, very different from, from Chuck Close, which was very cool and cerebral at that time and the kind of stylish pop of, of Alex Katz. These were a very different approach to, to that large scale portrait, but it was something that was in the air at the time. And, and um, one of the things that Brown was doing was doing people of color, which there weren't a lot of people doing that at that time. Um, So as I said, when he rolled into town, there was all this color field stuff going on, um, minimalist uh, notions. The, the gestural stuff was kind of dying down a bit, but, but um, the color field painters were definitely involved in that still and using pores and, and, and um, gestural marking. Um, this is from 1969. And let's see, okay, here we go. Um, that, that musical inclination found an outlet in these abstract pieces. You know, basically there's this whole notion of synesthesia, which I, I have talked about before, the idea of cross sensory connections between sound and color. Um, um, some people have a neurological um, um, connection between sound and color. Somebody like uh, Joan Mitchell clearly had synesthesia and talked about it. Um, um, and it, it it can be it can be viewed as a as a um, uh, a challenge for someone, but you know, for an artist, it's really uh, a, an open avenue of exploration. And a lot of you know abstract painters, you know, Mondrian with Broadway Boogie Woogie, um, Stuart Davis, um, Kandinsky, all were. Um, interested in the relationship between music and color and color harmonies and how all that all that meshed together what what was what was the underlying thing the abex guys all the you know um um franz klein and 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 de kooning and pollock were all really really big jazz fans and it it definitely affected their their output um, so far from minimalism, um, in a way, Brown, Brown's work is kind of maximal. <laughs> and here he is, yeah, you know, uh, uh, a young, a, a young Brown, uh, standing in front of one of, one of his pieces, one of the color field pieces. So, you know, he had this big generous space so he could just lay out the, the canvas and, and um, let it rip. Um, and let's see, okay. And Sam Gilliam, who I've actually done a talk on, um, was somebody who, you know, this was from 1969, um, the piece, 
this piece is is probably from 72 or so. Um, so you can see the relationship between Sam Gilliam and, and, and Brown at this time. Really lovely veils of color. Uh, so as I said, Larry, far from, yeah. Could you explain, the, I don't see the relationship. Could you explain it more? The relationship Possibly. between yeah how they anticipate i i can't see it between you mean between music and the no no the, this the paintings between um the two get the two men oh between gilliam and gilliam. Uh, well the technique is is pores basically the canvas is wet and mm -hmm. they they're they're pouring on the color I see. Um, and and basically, if you look at 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 this piece, it's got these this veil like quality to it. The same thing is true if you look closely at this one. The color stuff is is different, but but basically the approach is very similar. It's it's about these you know these pores of color and 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 allowing them to do you know these kind of crazy reticulations and make make all these um uh beautiful kind of strange curls you know this this again goes back to somebody like frankenthaler who was actually kind of the godmother of 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 all these guys but good question okay and like i said um there was a lot of this minimalist business and, and I would consider Brown a maximalist. I mean, basically what he did with this, with this piece is it's, it's spattered, it's poured, it's dripped, it's gestural rhythms set up by, you know, by his, by the movement of his brush. Um, you know, so there's, there's these rich saturated areas of color And again, um, it, it's, you know, if you're familiar with Ornette Coleman's music, it's very um, uh, kind of jumpy and, and, and um, uh, you, you, got, you got to kind of search for the, the unifying factors. Um, so, ah. And so he was really searching for his own kind of language um, at that point. Um, his own kind of cryptic visual language and experimenting with different approaches. Um, and I put up this Paul Clay because I saw that, there, that there's this kind of playful, um, diagrammatic kind of quality to, to this uh, piece by Brown, and and I thought immediately of of that kind of playfulness that's in clay, and that kind of mysterious quality too. That that you know, um, Paul Clay was very much involved in kind of mythological and and mystical pursuits, and and I think that 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 comes through to some degree in in this Brown piece. It's it's very spontaneous, but at the same time, there's there's a you know a repeat pattern of certain elements and a, a diagrammatic um, um, implicit uh, kind of messaging. We we don't know what the we don't know what the message is exactly, but but it, it, it makes you kind of search for it. And here he is, um, reaching back into his African-American background and that kind of African root. Um, uh, I think he was very aware of what was going on in, in the, um, the kind of, 
I, I don't want to use the word outsider, self-taught um, uh, realm. And, and he saw a lot of that stuff having come up from the South. Um, there, there's a, an element of that here. And, and he also had um, Native American blood that, that um, he kind of used to explore. So there's a, there's a universal quality that he's going after. He's kind of checking out these different cultures and pulling them together. Um, and in the mid seventies, late seventies, his work became much more um, expressive. Um, in fact, there was a whole um, school of, or group of painters called the Neo-Expressionists. And um, it wouldn't hurt to, you know, do a little definition of what that movement was about and what kind of emerged in the late 70s. Somebody like Julian Schnabel, who was like, you know, you know using crock shards and, and stuff like that, very rough materials adhered to the canvas. Um, um, Basquiat comes out of this. He was, he cut, he cut his teeth in, in, you know, basically he, he emerged on the scene in the early eighties, but basically when he was coming up, this neo-expressionist movement, a kind of, um, let's see, it's, it's characterized by a kind of rough, um, uh, quality. Um, the paint handling is really raw. It's very subjective. Um, um, it, they were going after emotional content where the minimalists were, you know, kind of um, really cerebral about how they were approaching things. Um, a lot of the pop artists were very cerebral about how they were approaching their work. Um, where these guys are just letting it rip, um, delving into emotional territory, trying to trying to really bring that out. So I think that that was that was really something I wanted to talk a little bit about here. Um, and here is this is 1987, a portrait that that. Brown did of Max Beckman. On the right, you see Max Beckman's self-portrait. Now Beckman, actually, he probably met Beckman. Beckman was in the United States and teaching at, at that point in the 70s. I believe he was, he was still alive and kicking. Um, so you can see now, Beckman comes out of the German expressionist tradition and you know, that's, that's who the, the neo-expressionists were kind of modeling themselves after or interested in. Again, look at the scale. The size of the, the brown piece is, is 84 by 72 inches. That's a big canvas. It's, you know, seven by six feet. So it's a substantial, that's one substantial head. Uh, <laughs> Okay, now this is the series that's in the Hudson River Museum. Um, basically, there's these five uh, drawing painting pieces. They're fairly large scale. Um, uh, I think they're like 60 inches tall by, you know, 42 inches wide. Um, and this is a, this actress series. It, um, are, they're in the show, they're, they're kind of a progression through a scene. Um, this young woman worked for um, uh, Brown and his wife. She was a secretary. I think she came from South America. I can't remember now, um, but she was an actress also. So she would be running lines and going through scenes and stuff like that. And, and I think this is something which stimulated um, Brown to do this series. 
And what he was doing was trying to capture the moment to moment emotions as they changed in the scene that this woman was rehearsing. So they get more and more agitated as we go through the series until we hit this final scream. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting, you know, what he did and he was really after trying to, um, how can I put this? Um, trying to be sensitive to the story that's being told. Um, the, possible marking of emotional content um, and you know using using this color as a as a, um, a a correlation to emotion okay and you know throughout his career so this is this was these were from 1987 um, this Billy Holiday piece was 1986 uh, on the on the right, and that's a big piece. That's again, it's 90 by 78 inches, and really interesting content in the piece. I mean, you know, there's there's the monkey on her back, and you see the you see the syringe in its hand. Um, you basically looking down at the at the the. The woman being smothered on the on the on the table there. There's a holiday on the on the on the arm. Um, so it's kind of like having life snuffed out of it. If you look back on the tr on the tree in the background, you see the strange fruit reference. Um, and you know she's got the name. He's got the names of of the the musicians that she worked with, Coleman Hawkins and, and Count Basie and Lester Young and all of that. Um, these, the other two, I mean, basically he comes back to Billie Holiday a number of times throughout, throughout his career. And, and you know, it, it really is. I understand that when you came into his studio, you, there would always be music going. And, and so, you know, it isn't that he, that he tried to paint the music. He tried to embody the, the music. So he would, wouldn't necessarily be listening to the actual tune when he tried to paint the thing, but it, it, was, it was really the mood and atmosphere that was created by the music that he was, that he was trying to get. Not too hung up on, on likenesses, although they're, they're there. Okay. Um, I can't identify all these ladies, but I definitely see Billie Holiday there. And there's, there's Ella, there's Bessie Smith, there's, there's the, the group. They had the right to sing the blues. <laughs> Really strong, interesting work. Don't have the size on this one, unfortunately, but it looks like it was pieced together. Okay. And then, <clears throat> you know, basically, Alice Neal kind of um, gave permission to use distortion. Um, Although you know Picasso and 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 many of the German expressionists and and Soutine all distorted like crazy, but but there's a level of social realism in Alice Neal. <clears throat> she used the distortion, but but there's also that level of of um, um, outsider people that are on the kind of outside cultural outsiders they were on the edge of of society um, and 
this this great Duke Ellington piece. I I I I don't know the size of it, but I'm I'm guessing that it's a big one. It's another probably 84 by by um, by 78 or something like that. Really remarkable. Okay. And, you know, this was 19, he did these in 1979. Um, uh, they're, they're using a lot of different materials, basically crayon, acrylic, pencil, all kinds of stuff on the, on the drawing piece. Um, and there's a graffiti-like quality to it. And this was, this was before, before Basquiat and, and a lot of the graffiti artists were kind of like, mainstreaming um uh and again you know we've got this john henry piece um if if you were with me two weeks ago um you know basically john henry um was somebody that that uh we brought up in the last in the last group and, and he's a kind of mythological figure and really interesting with, with the, the um, elements that are, that are in, in the composition, this crazy dog on the bottom. Great, zany, um, uh, complementary, red and green, complementary colors. And again, um, wacky kind of accumulation this, this painting was started in 1977, finished in 1996, mixed media on canvas, big piece, again, 84 by 60. Um, you know, by that time, by the time he finished it, he was no longer living in New York, basically. He had moved out to uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, and was living out there at that point with his family. Um, but you can see the kind of graffiti-like quality to the work. And here is John Michael. And, and um, this is a brown on the, on the left. And you can see that, that it, it, this was from 1994. So John Michael was dead already by, by this time. So this is kind of an homage to Basquiat that Brown painted. Okay. And um, he, he, did, he got into doing a whole series of um, of large scale murals out west, actually in, in St. Louis, in, in Kansas City, and several other places, he got commissions to do these large scale kind of religious murals, which is really kind of interesting. Now in 19, when was it? It was 1980, I think it was 86 or 87, he, had a yeah 85 to 87 he had a residency in beijing and uh had a major show in the national museum in china of over 100 pieces he was teaching over there um really interesting you know he was actually the second artist rauschenberg was the first artist to have a show in beijing um in the national museum but he was the second guy and he had over a hundred pieces in that show. Um, so these large scale religious themed murals, let's see, here's another one. No, now this one I know was started in, in New York. And so he started this in the late seventies, early eighties. Um, and it's the last supper. Uh, so, he engages 
art history, music, um, kind of urban and, and you know, religion, um, political characters, uh, writers, poets, you know, some of these people would be recognizable, um, though I, I don't have a list of who, who they were, but they were, they were people that were around him that he used in this piece. Okay. And this is very different, but really wonderful, you know, buoyant color. Um, again, it's kind of Mardi Gras. Uh, now, unfortunately, None of this work is in that show. The only pieces that are in the show at the Hudson River Museum are the ones that I showed you uh, earlier, the, the series of the actress. Um, but there is a, a gallery in New York that represents him. Most of what they have, it's um, uh, Barry Campbell and they're down in, in Chelsea. Mostly what they have are the abstract pieces, although they have some of the figurative work too. Okay. Um, and again, um, the literary references are there too. So he, he would draw from um, really cultural icons, black cultural icons and um, this James Baldwin piece on the on the left is his. The one on the right is Buford Delaney, who who he actually probably met because uh, Delaney was back and forth between Paris and and New York throughout his career. Um, so they, in all likelihood, did did meet up. Okay. Um, the Johnny Hodges piece is a print, but the Oscar Peterson piece is, is enormous. I mean, this is, this is, you know, again, 60 by 84, um, big piece. And he was not the only one who was inspired by jazz music. I mean, you know this this Count Basie piece is uh, is again a big big piece eighty forty two, um, the Romar Bearden um, piece is really a wonderful piece also and he again and again comes back to jazz as as an uh, a central part of of his work. Um, this business of portraiture, um, he really focused in on portraits of, of black people, people of color um, throughout his career. There were not many people that were doing that. Aside from somebody like Alice Neal, there weren't a lot of people that were doing that. Now there's a lot of young black artists that are hooking into this and really um, uh, pursuing the portrait and figurative narrative work as, as a really fruitful avenue to, to address the, the culture. Um, and again, um, the, the piece on the, on the left is 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 a a, a a brown piece he um he <clears throat> painted really heavy duty you know a lot of paint glopped on there um on the right is a piece from thornton dial who was considered a kind of outsider artist um self-taught um a lot of the self-taught artists kind of get to this level of that they're they're kind of driven by this this need to to do these things 
and they're not they're not doing it because they're going to get you know into the art world or anything like that they're just doing it because this is something that comes to mind and they got to get it out um but i love this wacky piece on the on the left by by brown i mean that just i i'd love to see more of those i don't know i don't know where they're where they're hidden but uh, uh i'm sure they're around uh, ah and portrait of the music i love and this is this is a brown piece um and i put up this G's bend quilt because i saw a, a a, a correlation there, I, I, and on, and again, I am sure that Frederick Brown knew the the G's Bend quilts and had seen them, um, especially by two thousand two. They they had there there were there were shows around of of these quilts, so you know he he used it as a as a avenue to. Um, uh, focus his love of harmony and the play of 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 color, but I think there's a real strong relationship between between these two pieces. Um, ah, okay. Again, Brown crossing the River Styx. Um, it's it's very. Um, mythologically oriented, um, uh, kind of mythopoetic, quasi-religious elements in it. And on, on the right is, again, a self-taught artist who, again, kind of is intuitively throwing these things in there it's got a very egyptian quality to it you know the kind of these these birds and that 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 figure um so you know they they kind of there's a there's a name for these self-taught artists which is outsider artists well i don't know um i i see a crossover and 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 I think I think Brown embraced that. Um, he did he did a lot of paintings. There's a ton of paintings that they've got at the. Um, uh, it's there's a museum in in um, Kansas City, and the name will come back to me in a minute. And I actually mentioned it at the end, so we'll 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 look at that. But he's got at least a hundred paintings in that collection which you can go to their site and look at and he does a lot of paintings of other painters paintings um again he was friends with de kooning um one of the one of the people that frequented that that uh that studio in on worcester street was was de kooning i mean they they spent time together they actually both were showing in the in the late seventies in a gallery that so so they knew each other from there and and they were they were really you know um, Brown really embraced that atmosphere and and listened to the wisdom that could be gleaned from all these really developed artists that were around him. Uh, so, um, actually, Carrie James Marshall painted this painting in 2012, the year that that uh, Brown died. Um, and I saw a kind of relationship between the way the figures are kind of um, interacting in this in this um, the the school of beauty <laughs> um, and the relationship between these figures in in this in this uh, brown piece 
I, I don't know that that that, that uh, Kerry James Marshall saw this piece, but I think there was something that they were tuning into um, about that kind of interaction, that group that group interaction, um, the kind of jauntiness of the figures. And again, um, this is this is a large scale mural. Um, um, oh, it's the Kemper Museum that's in Kansas City that holds a lot of his work. They were big supporters of his work. Um, and this is is a show that was at um, the Museum of Contemporary Religious Art in St. Louis at St. Louis University in Missouri. Um, I, I just, I drew up this, this piece, the kind of Black Madonna was something that I wanted to, you know, bring out and, and, you know, point to, um, really interesting approach, very unique vision. Frederick Brown, you know, these things are fairly large scale, you can see that's him doing, doing a talk, addressing the attendees at the opening um, of that show. So you can see the scale of things. And I'm gonna leave you with uh, Nelson Mandela, really sensitive, you know, I mean, he did a lot of these, he did all these, these things from photographs. I don't think many of them were painted directly. Although some of the, the pieces that were in the studio in the seventies were from drawings that he did from friends who sat for him. Now, the Kemper Museum is the one that has a bunch of the Frederick Brown pieces. Um, there's a, uh, a talk with his son, at, at Barry Campbell. So if you go to Barry Campbell uh, Gallery, I think you can find this, but it's on YouTube. Um, and then there's a, a, a thing that I haven't actually listened to yet, but uh, I'm, I'm interested in Universal Hardcourts. And this is, this is actually from New Orleans. So there's gonna be a lot of jazz mixed in with his work. Um, and then there's the frederickbrown.org. Frederickjbrown.org is his foundation. And so there's a lot of pieces on there. Um, and that's going to do it for, for this week. Um, in two weeks, we're going to be doing Frank Bowling, who is having a show, big show up at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. So... If there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to try and answer them. But otherwise, that's it. Okay, I, I just have to. Hi, Larry. Uh, I don't see any questions, but that okay. was really nice, and I never heard about him. Yeah. So thank you.